Hi, and welcome to the next webinar in 12D's training webinar series. My name is Lisa Stewart, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator at 12D Solutions. 12D's training webinars showcase common industry challenges, taking a close look at industry best practices and how these can be implemented using 12D products. The aim of these webinars is to upskill 12D users and broaden their understanding of the capabilities of 12D products. We run these webinars regularly and record them for posting through our website and on YouTube. The previous webinars from this training series, as well as the webinars from our Industry Solutions series, are all available on our YouTube channels if you missed those. While we wait for everyone to finish joining and get comfortable, I'll launch a polling question. You'll have about 30 seconds to answer about your role on stormwater drainage design jobs, and then I'll show the results. Okay, it looks as though we've got lots of designers here today, so I think we'll all get a lot out of the session. Okay, let's get started. During this live presentation, you'll be able to type your questions along the way, as shown on the screen, and we'll answer as many as possible throughout the webinar. At the end, I'll read out some of your questions to the presenter for his insights. Today's webinar will be presented by Owen Thornton, who is both an engineer and a programmer. He's been writing, supporting, and using engineering design software for two decades. Owen joined 12D Solutions in 2003 as a programmer with an interest in design automation, and has since grown to become a 12D model specialist in drainage, utilities, volumetrics, plotting, and system setup. Owen runs regular 12D model training courses in drainage design, geometric design, customization, and 12D PL macro programming. Today's presentation, Stormwater Drainage Design Fundamentals, Project Review and Delivery, is episode six in this series, which covers the basic and intermediate aspects of the three waters modules in 12D model 14, with special emphasis on the design of stormwater drainage. In this final episode of that series, we'll review the storm analysis results and make some small improvements to the pipe sizes and grades, whilst discussing the settings of the water network editor and feedback from the analysis in the output window. The major storm events are also analysed, highlighting the different settings required. Finally, deliverables are produced, including plan, long section and structure detailed drawings, hydrology and hydraulic calculation tables, and a BIM of the design in IFC format. Over to you, Owen. Thank you, Lisa. And yes, hello everyone. Welcome to episode six uh, and the final in this uh, series. And it's been a lot of fun and a lot of work uh, to produce this, but today we are going to wrap things up and we're going to cover um, a lot of the, the things that have yet to be covered in this series, I suppose. We're going to have a look at the analysis that, and the design that we produced in the first five episodes and perhaps refine it a little bit, talk about the results. Uh, what does it all mean? How do we um, uh, you know, make the, the final improvements that need to be made? And all importantly, how do we um, get the job out the door? How do we produce the deliverables that we need to produce, such as drawings and tables, and uh, if, you, if you're in, living in the BIM world, like some of us are, how to produce a building information model um, of the design um, for you know, looking at in, in potentially other packages or just in 12D, because 12D is a BIM package as well, um, believe it or not. Um, we'll also look at the major storm in all of that as well. But before we get into that, just a quick reminder, uh, I've shown this in the last few episodes, but uh, all of the previous episodes are um, available. You can go to the 12D Model Forum, or you can go to YouTube, or you can go to the 12D Wiki. There's lots of different ways to find all of the recordings of the previous episodes. And this one will add to the list after it's uh, all uh, done and dusted and in the can, so to speak. Um, uh, but on the 12D Model Forum, you can also download the project that I've been showing in this series as well, and that's the completed project. Um, you do need to register and log into the forum for access, and if you go to the Hints and Tips section and search for Training Webinar Series, Stormwater Drainage Design Fundamentals, or something like that, you are sure to find it very quickly. And this link here 
uh, is the link to download a zip file of this project. Okay, it's it's a sizable one. It's got a raster in there as well. Uh, but I think it's well worth having a look at. There's a lot of good examples in there and some good chains and all sorts of goodies. Um, uh, and it may help us as well if you're following along watching um, the videos at a later date. So to start off with episode six though, I wanted to do a quick review of the water network editor because we did in way, way back in episode one, we set up our water models, both the stormwater and the stormwater transverse models um, using a water model template. And that set a whole lot of settings um, for us automatically. Uh, and I thought I might just have a quick review of that. And we're not gonna go through the whole network editor, but I wanna focus on the global tab and the defaults tab, which are probably the two most important tabs that affect, sort of potentially affect everything in your water model. Okay, so without reading out all of this list here, these are the items that I'm gonna go through um, live and, and just show you what I'm talking about in, as part of this review of the global tab. Um, you know, we'll look at the method and the tins and the connection points and the runoff C method, basically some, some pretty important settings here that are going to potentially affect the whole model. So let's have a look in 12D. Today I'm running 14C2H, which was released recently, and I would encourage you to upgrade to the latest version of version 14. Um, and this is pretty much where we left it at the end of episode five, where we added all of our um, uh, flooded widths and flood extents overland flow that we considered there. Uh, and so far that's just for the um, minor event. And we didn't look at the analysis in any great detail, but if I have a look in the um, network editor, I'll just load my stormwater model into the network editor. And I wanna look on the global tab. And what I'm really wanting to uh, point out first up is just when you're reviewing your design, there's a few key things that you wanna check for. First up, and this isn't really actually part of the global tab, but right at the bottom here, there's a method box. And this used to be um, part of the global main tab, but it's since recently been moved to the bottom of the network editor because it really is um, uh, quite fundamental now because depending on what setting you go for uh, with the method box here, it changes the appearance and the mode that the water network editor um, gets into and different tabs will appear and disappear depending on um, the mode. Now our water model templates set it to rational for doing rational method calculations. But the default, if you don't use a water model template is none and it creates a lot of questions saying, where has my catchment tab gone? Because you don't get a catchment tab in, when it's in none mode. So you simply need to change it to rational mode. And these other ones below, Ilsax, Lawrenson, NZ, EPA, SCS, they are, they are a range of different hydrograph methods that are part of the dynamic drainage. Now this series isn't covering dynamic at all. There will be future subsequent um, webinar series covering that I am told. Um, um, so I'm, I'm sticking to the basics um, here with just the rational method for better or worse. I know that's contentious to some people that you know some people say you shouldn't use the rational method at all. It still exists though and people are still using it. And so that's why we're emphasizing it um, in this series. But it's not really about the rational method. It's about um, 12D um, and, and stormwater design in 12D model. Okay, the rational method's a good place to start. Uh, and there's a couple of other um, methods here for the network editor if you're doing a water supply network or a sewer network as well. Okay, but that's an important one. And for the rational method, you definitely want this method set to rational. Um, you can also on the global main tab here, just do a quick check of the tins you have allocated, the finished surface and the natural surface tins you've allocated to your water model. The water model is stormwater and there are your two tins. Now we had a good look at those two tins in um, episode one. Uh, and yes, I can confirm that they're all right. Um, these two little tick boxes we talked a little bit about in uh, episodes uh, possibly two and three, I think. Uh, and whether or not you want to use connection points, it is optional, um, but for a pit and pipe network um, these days, I probably would recommend it. And I'd probably also recommend um, defining or ticking on this tick box to define the length of a pipe from the edge of the node wall to edge of node wall, rather than from node center to node center. 
certainly with connection points turned on, it makes more sense. Now, if I were to open up another network editor though, and just have a quick look at my transverse model, the SWT model here. So I've got two network editors open here. The one on the left is the transverse, editing the transverse model. And if I go to the global main tab, you can see I haven't bothered to use node connection points or defined um, link length um, the way I have in the stormwater model. And you can do different things there. It, it really is your choice. Um, but for stormwater, uh, for transverse models, which are primarily made up of culverts and channels, all of my node sizes um, are zero. And when you've got zero node sizes, these node connection points don't really offer you a whole lot most of the time. Okay, so it is potentially an option to turn these tick boxes off as I've done there. Um, but comparing the two models, other than that, they're identical on the global main tab. Um, Moving on to what I would call the most important tab on the network editor for the both these two models. Uh, that's the global utility models tab here. And we spent quite a bit of time in the previous episodes filling in uh, this tab. Um, we did the road design and the service clash file, I think in episode three. The catchments were in episode four and the overland flow model um, in episode five. Okay. now. The reason I think this is the most important tab is this is where all of the automation in 12D comes from as far as stormwater design. Because rather than sitting there and typing in every little minute detail for every node and link in your water models, if you can use the information that's in already in your project, such as details of the road design and the crossing services and catchment polygons and overland flow models and all of that, 12D can use that information to automatically calculate and automate the process a whole lot. So minimize the amount of manual entry. So it's well worthwhile making sure these are set up um, as efficiently and effectively as possible. Now there are a couple of minor differences which I highlighted in earlier um, series, but basically I just wanna check that everything is set up the way um, that we expect. And I, I can see I don't need to make any changes there. Um, back on the global main tab, uh, might want to also check a couple of other details here as well as the tins. I glossed over this hydrology and hydraulic data and it is set the same in both models here and I've chosen in today to use a runoff C method. Now this is unique to the rational method, the only the rational method bothers with C values. Uh, and there's a few different modes there. Now, whether or not you should use this QDM 2007, well, I'm trying to follow QDM guidelines in this um, webinar series. Um, and the QDM is probably the, the predominant um, guideline left in Australia that still covers the rational method. Um, so that's why I've opted to do this because I am using the rational method. Um, but a lot of people um, have, it's almost identical in fact to the ARNR 1987 method for calculating C values. A lot of people say, have questioned these two methods to say whether, whether or not they give good C values and I'm not going to argue um, with that. And I will say that uh, if you've got any better information, by all means use this direct mode or the direct times FY. The difference is the direct mode, you type in the C values that you want to use for your minor and major events directly. And the direct times FY um, is you type in um, C10 values for a 10 year average recurrence interval. And it, they get multiplied by an urban frequency factor depending on what your minor and major events actually are. Okay, uh, the ACT one, I'm, I'm, it still works as far as I know. I'm not sure if it's still actually used in the ACT. It was developed quite a number of years ago now, um, but really there's not a whole lot to it. Today I'm going to let the QDM um, um, method do its thing and we'll review the C values that it calculates. And if we don't like them, there's always the option to come back and change them and set them ourselves. Okay, but it is always probably the most contentious subject in the whole of the rational method is the C values. Okay, and uh, treat them always with a high degree of suspicion. Um, 
Lastly, on the global tab here, um, it's worthwhile just having a quick review of the notes tab. Now, in my case, both my models have been set up um, with the same set of notes there. And this is just a great space where you can document particular details that you may need to document about your model for easy reference. And I've done it as an example here, explaining how I've set up um, the stormwater models in this particular project. Okay, so that's all I wanted to do uh, as a quick review of the global tab. Um, moving on to the defaults tab now, I'll do a quick review of this one as well. And there's three main components or sub tabs of the defaults tab. Uh, and that is the links, the nodes and the catchments in reverse order. And we're gonna talk about some of the details um, that I've listed here. Uh, and let's sort of go straight back to 12D now and do it right now. So that's on the defaults tab now, and I'll start off on the links tab. So I've got both network editors open now, editing both different models, transverse on the left, longitudinal stormwater model on the right. And there are a couple of little differences um, in the way I've set up the two different models. On the right hand side, the longitudinal model, I've used slightly different invert design settings there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, these particular settings a little bit later. Uh, and, but the, for culvert and channel systems in the SWT model, this um, grade mode of drape inverts, especially if it's predominantly channels, um, that's a very good mode. Uh, the drape inverts is spe specific to um, when you've already got your channels built into your finished surface tin, and the drape invert simply drapes um, the channel inverts to the channel as long as you place your, uh, your water string within that channel in the tin. Uh, so that's nice and simple. And I've also set um, the alignment mode to align the inverts um, and apply any drop. And I think we're applying a zero drop in this drop file. Okay, now within the invert design section here, and this is on the defaults links tab, um, there's a cover file, a grade file, and a drop file on for both. And I believe they're all using the same files here. Um, there might be a little difference for the drop file. And it's worthwhile just having, taking a moment to look at these because it is important that you set these um, three files up because they can do an awful lot of work for you. Because rather than just having a single default cover value for your links or a single default minimum grade or a single default drop, um, for your, through, the, through the structures, these files allow you to specify a range and a, a, a much larger range of possibilities um, all in one fell swoop. So just uh, looking at the right hand side here, I might just open up each one of these files individually very quickly just to have a look at them. The pipe cover file, the grade file, and the drop file. Okay, I'll just look at it for the stormwater model on the right hand side here. And if I just expand them out a little bit, what the cover file does is it allows you to specify a table of pipe types or link classes or pipe classes if you like. For all the different pipe classes or types that you might be using, you can specify a default cover limit, which is useful for the grading. Okay, it saves you having to overly go through the network editor on the explicit tabs and change defaults because you've got multiple defaults here for different pipe types. Okay, uh, again, if you make any changes, you must remember to hit the right button on these little file editors within the network editor because the network editor only stores the name of the file. All the details are stored in the file itself. Now, moving on to the grade file. The grade file for different size um, pipes or links, um, it allows you to specify different minimum grade and maximum allowable grades uh, in a little table as well. Okay, so you can do that. Now, in my case, it's not making a huge difference there. Most of my minimum grades are still gonna be half a percent, but some people allow the grades to go a bit flatter than that. Okay, you can do it as you see fit. The drop file isn't that powerful in stormwater design. It's probably more useful in sewer design and things like that. But here we allow you to specify different drops through the structures of your, um, or the nodes of your um, stormwater model or water model based on the deflection angle of the two links. 
Um, and here I've just said, oh, I don't care what the deflection angle is. I've just put in a massive 999 degrees. Uh, and whatever my deflection angle is, I want at least a 20 millimeter drop. Why have I chosen a 20 millimeter drop? To be honest, I don't know. I don't know if a 20 millimeter drop actually does anything in a stormwater model, but historically a lot of people have used a 20 millimeter drop, so I'm doing it today. I would be just as um, um, happy to go with a zero drop, and I don't really honestly think in the long term it would make very much difference at all. It would just be make your network slightly cheaper because it won't be quite as deep. Okay, but that's the, the three files there I wanted to show you, worthwhile setting them. If for whatever reason, when it looks in this file, or if you don't specify a file, and it doesn't find a match for your pipe type or your pipe size, or even your deflection angle, it's instead going to go and use the values that we set in our project defaults here and the water string defaults. And it's going to take the uh, minimum grade there and the minimum cover and the drop there and use that. Now that's uh, a little bit undesirable because this is a project setting. I can't save these values with my model. Um, and that means I can't export it out of this project as well. So you are, you are always better off using these cover grade and drop files. Okay, um, looking at the link size design section two, comparing the two models here, they're both set to this design mode, part full pipe freeboard design. And that's generally the one I'd recommend. And again, this is only for the rational method because uh, it's only the rational method that sizes pipes at this stage. Um, but there is another option that's potentially um, viable here, the pressurized pipe. And now that's going to, it's slightly more conservative, but it will assume at the upstream end of every link um, that the pipe will flow full. Even if it's the pipe's big enough for part full flow in the pipe, it makes an, a conservative assumption that the pipe's flowing full there. And it does often uh, mean that your pipes need to be a little bit bigger if you go with that option. But uh, to some people, there is a little bit of uncertainty as to what the hydraulics actually do at the upstream end um, of each link. And so you do have that option, but I'm quite happy to go with the part full pipe freeboard design. And that means it's going to test against a freeboard limit at compared against the great level of your nodes. And I have set two different uh, freeboard limits here. The transfer system is using 300 millimetres and the longitudinal system is using 150 millimetres. And that is measured from the great level. And at, at the top of my nodes there is where my great level is set. And 12D is going to try and, when we size the, the links or size the pipes in our analysis, it's sizing it to try and keep the hydraulic grade line at least 150 millimetres below the great level of each node. Okay, and that is what freeboard design means. There is another thing here called the flow depth limit and we're not using that at all. That's only used in this flow depth design. Um, and in fact, I'm not sure where um, that, uh, which particular um, places in the world use flow depth limit design. Um, I, I haven't actually used it in the real world. Um, so I'll, I'll just gloss over that one. Um, so that's all I really want to talk about with the default links. Moving on to the default uh, nodes tab. Um, there's a couple of settings here that I didn't really spend a lot of time talking about. One was the KU settings here. Uh, and if you click on the options here, again, on the default nodes, and again, I might just bring up my stormwater transverse to compare, you can see there are some differences here. Um, I'm also um, setting my cover RLs and great RLs differently, but we did talk about that way back in episode three, I think, uh, the differences that we set. But the KU method, um, I'm going with a direct option there as a default, and I would only override the default at uh, culvert inlets um, there, because 12D can't calculate um, any KU or, or pressure change losses at nodes uh, in open channels. And so you, it's up to you to set the KU factors appropriately if you've got bends and, and things like that in your channels, okay? But for pits and pipes, I will absolutely recommend this mode here, this using the Missouri and hair charts and get 12D to calculate the KU and KW factors for you. Uh, and along with that, we've got the option, if you are going with this option, 
you need to nominate what the configuration is. And by default, I would invariably say for a pit and pipe network um, that the best default would be fair, which means it's going to give a relatively high KU and KW value at each node because it's assuming that you don't have a particularly hydraulically efficient configuration. And that is a pretty good assumption in this day and age because the way that pits and pipe networks tend to be constructed these days is a little bit different from how they used to do it in years past. In years past, they would spend a little bit more time uh, and effort in construction and actually um, make sure that where an incoming pipe um, came into a node that as much as possible, they would minimise the amount of inflow that would hit the pit walls or the node walls and try and get it going straight into the outlet pipe. Well, these days I'd have to say in general terms that ease of construction tends to win out over um, hydraulic efficiency and they tend to prefer to build pits that are less hydraulically efficient but that are easier and possibly cheaper to build. Okay, and that means I would, I, as a general recommendation, as a default setting, go with the KU config of FAIR. Now, in general terms, what's the difference between these settings? Well, between preferred and good, you won't see very much difference at all. The KU values will be nice and low, and the losses, the jump in the hydraulic grade line will be relatively low with preferred or good. There's very little difference between these two, but then there's a big jump between good and fair. And suddenly you'll find as soon as any part of the incoming jets start to hit the pit wall, that becomes, uh, you get into this territory here with the fair and poor. There's very little difference between fair and poor. We could almost have made this two settings here rather than four. One is, is it aligned or is it unaligned um, in terms of the uh, incoming and outgoing pipes at the nodes, okay? But as a general recommendation, I would say a default setting for FAIR for a pit and pipe network um, that's built in the modern um, way, typically. Okay, again, there may be cases where that's not a good default, but that's my recommendation for this particular network. Okay, uh, also I'll mention these on-grade and SAG inlet efficiencies. I did talk about them in uh, a previous episode, the inlet efficiencies a little bit when we talked about bypass flow. Uh, they're otherwise known as choke factors. And these are the, the default choke factors that will be applied for on-grade and SAG inlets for both minor and major events. And I've set them all to one here, which means they're fully uh, open or unblocked, if you like. Now, some people will balk at that and say, that's not what the guidelines say. Certainly the ARNR says something different and the QDOM manual says something different again. And in fact, there's not a great deal of um, viable research on appropriate um, inlet efficiencies or choke factors to set it at inlet pits. Uh, and in fact, the ARNR and the QDOM are both very tentative in their recommendations. But I'm not going to get into any arguments about that. The reason I've set them all to one here is because of the particular pit types I'm using. These are the Brisbane City Council uh, pit types, which are used uh, widely or similar pits. They might be called different things, but they're very similar in terms of their inlet capacity. They're used widely throughout Queensland. And the inlet capacity has all been tested and published by Brisbane City Council. And there's a note on their charts that say that they've already pre-applied the uh, blockage factor to the charts. And that is why I haven't applied any additional choke or blockage factor to the pits there, and that's why I'm going with ones. Now that, um, some people may disagree with that, that's fine. At all times, go with what your verifier says, not with what I say, but that would be my recommendation there and why it is set the way it is. Okay, so moving on then, if I just do a quick check, I've done pretty much the same thing um, with the chokes um, for the culvert and channels as well, uh, and certainly I don't think the uh, the recommendations in the manuals cover culverts and uh, channel, well, they, they probably do cover culverts in fact, and whether or not you should apply um, blockage factors at culverts, you probably should. I actually haven't, just now that I say that, I haven't, don't think I have considered that at all in my culvert design, and perhaps I should. Um, but other than that, yes, you're setting the KU methods uh, directly, the KU values directly, 
in the transverse model here for your culverts and channels. Um, lastly, on the defaults tab, we'll move on to the catchment uh, tab. And within the defaults catchments tab, there are five sub tabs for the five different catchment sets. And it's really set number one is a little bit more important than all the others. And it's worthwhile setting um, set number one uh, completely because the way set number one works is if you don't set a value, if you leave a value blank on any of the other sets, say any one of these that you can see a blank on set number two or three or four or five, it will take its value from set number one. Okay. Now, if I just look at the, the um, stormwater model for the moment, now I'm only using set one and set two in the stormwater model. And I can see I've set set one here, which is the brownie colored uh, catchment areas in the road reserve. They're set 70% impervious. Uh, and that's because there's, there is actually a vegetated or grassy verge within the road reserve that represents about 30% of the catchment. And so 70% of the brown catchments are gonna be using these values and 30% of the area will be using these values. In both cases, I've set a direct TC uh, of five minutes, um, but there will be a different C value involved for the, um, the pervious fraction because it's vegetated as opposed to um, uh, paved. Uh, on set number two, which is the yellowier um, colored catchments within the lots there, uh, the big difference here is the percent impervious. Now that percent impervious is probably a little bit too low. I've kept it deliberately low to keep my flow rates um, down so that I don't have to have too many bits and pipes in this demonstration data set. And that all, that's all this is. This is just a demonstration. It's not a real job. Um, so in most cases, your percent impervious within a, a lot would be a bit higher than 30%. Perhaps for these larger lots over here that are sort of semi-rural, that might be a little bit more appropriate. But the big difference apart from the percent impervious, the impervious fraction, which is 30% of all the yellow lots, that's gonna be identical to set number one. But the pervious fraction is using a completely different TC method. Now, following QDOM guidelines, they actually recommend using standard inlet times. And that is just a simple little lookup table that depends on the slope of the catchment. And I've just said that the, this, the, the slope on these lots is actually relatively constant. There is a bit of variation, but if you measure it, there's a sort of an average slope there that's around about 4%. And I've said, that's good enough for me. You could go to town and measure every little individual catchment there, but I don't think this, uh, the TC method, um, any of the TC methods are really that precise. Uh, so there may not be a great deal of benefit, but you can certainly do a sensitivity analysis on that. Um, aside from that though, the C values are gonna be calculated for us from the QDOM method. And that does depend on this um, vegetation soil index as well. And look, that's straight out of the QDOM manual as to what to go with there. Um, but it will make a difference when you're using the QDOM method and that method only. It's only used for that method for calculating C values. So that's just a very quick review. I think if I look on the transverse model, it's also using a set three which that is the big green catchments right up in the hills here. And that is fully vegetated, so 0% impervious. And it's going to use the Bransby-Williams equation to calculate the times of concentration of these big green catchments. We talked about the TC strings in the last episode, uh, and that's, um, the, that's dependent, this equation, the Bransby-Williams equation is dependent on the length and slope of the catchment. And we'll be me we've measured that for these um, catchments using TC strings. Okay, but that's how we're set up. Uh, and, that's our, and that's in fact in concluded our review of both the, the defaults tab and the global tab. Okay, so let us um, now do a little bit of a review of the analysis itself. Okay, so that's looking um, at the analysis panel uh, um, from that, that comes from the network editor. Uh, and we're gonna look at all of the details on the main tab there, including the, um, the output models and the reports. 
And we're also going to run the analysis and pay special attention to the output window, uh, looking at the problem messages and the warning messages that you may get in the uh, output window. And certainly we're going to try and make an attempt to discuss the ones we see and try and get rid of the problem messages. Um, and I always try and like to get rid of all the problem messages I can that result from the analysis. Uh, and yeah, will we be able to make any design improvements? The answer is almost invariably yes. You can always find a way to improve your design. So let's go through that now. Back to 12D. And I'm just going to look at the stormwater model for this. And I'm highlighting, if I zoom right in, I'm highlighting, I'm working on network A, which is this portion of the design here. And I'm really mainly going to be focusing on this trunk line, which is line A0, which starts up at these two sags and makes its way down to the outlet into the basin down here. The reason I'm focusing on this is it's actually quite an interesting part of the design in that this is the flattest part of our design. And flat always is a little bit trickier uh, in terms of stormwater drainage because it's harder to get the water to drain away. Um, so we have already run the analysis on this, but we didn't look at anything in, a particular, uh, in particular detail. So let's go ahead and run the analysis again. And bef before we do, I might just discuss some of the options that we have available here. Now, the bottom of the panel here, we've got our plan and long section outputs. These are just using plot parameter files to produce plot models um, to look at the results. And we ship in the library a whole bunch of good examples here. And the ones I'm using uh, from my customer library, which uh, is available from this icon here, um, these are just pretty much copies of, um, of the plot parameter files straight from the library that's installed with 12D. And I've just made some ever so slight modifications to them in the customer library and used them from there. Um, but the, the beauty of using the plot parameter files is that they're so customizable. So for instance, if you don't want to look at the outputs that I've got here for my plan results or in the long section, if you don't want to look at the long sections using this, you can choose your own plot parameter file and customize it. But you don't have to, if you don't want to, you can use our examples, which we think are pretty good. There's different ones again for doing dynamic drainage um, and, and sewer design and all of that sort of thing. There's a whole range of different plot parameter files to present the results in the way you want. Now, these are not going to be the plot parameter files you would use for your eventual final drawings. Okay, These have probably got a lot more detail in them than your final drawings. This is for you to review while you're designing. And I do see still a number of people trying to use 12D for stormwater design without utilising these um, these two plot models um, fully, and it makes life a lot harder, in my opinion, if you if you do that. We can also generate a report which we'll have a look at. This is both a hydrology and a hydraulic report, and I've combined them into one here by turning on that tick box and turning off that one. So the hydraulic report, which has got the same name, is appended to the hydrology report. Um, you can, if you don't like to look at them in a text format, like these two options here are text formats, you can uh, output a comma delimited or tab delimited file and look at them in a spreadsheet like Excel. Um, I prefer this box formatted one myself, but that's just me. Um, but we talked about the flood extents tab a lot in episode five, and we covered pretty much everything um, there, I believe. But back on the main tab, it's these analysis and network design factors here that maybe didn't get uh, a full description, and perhaps they deserve one. Obviously, you need to nominate your storm event type um, and, um, and the frequency. Now, the frequency here is specified in AEP because that's what's the units in the hydro or rainfall file. Okay, now 39.3 happens to be the same as a two-year event, which is typically the, the standard event you'd run in according to the QDOM manual in Queensland. Okay, um, so we're going to be sizing the pipes here for this two-year event. Uh, it's using the IFD table in the rainfall file. The pipe travel time method, you've got a number of different options there. And to be honest, there's no theoretical basis to, to say that one of these options is better than the other. I tend to just use this T equals L on V cap for historical reasons more than anything else, because it tends to be historically before 12D was developed, 
this was the way uh, it tended to be done um, for people using other software packages. That's the way they tended to do it. But you can try the other options and it will make slight differences to your flow rates um, by considering different travel time velocities, uh, travel times and travel velocities in the pipes. Okay, and that is again a setting that's unique to the rational method. It doesn't affect the dynamic at all. Um, whether to turn on the partial areas, well, I, th I think I said in the last episode, I always have it on uh, and it will do a, um, a better estimation of your flow rates, make them potentially a bit larger than they would if you have it ticked off. We've got a, we went to the trouble of developing a bypass model, so I definitely consider bypass flows. Uh, now the consider bypass flows tick though, that enables or disables um, this funny looking box called the QX routing increment. Now that's something that you'll see more in the major event and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but typically in the rational method, the rational method via the Q equals CIA, it will calculate a flow rate for every node and every link in the model. And the flow rates are calculated before the hydraulic grade line. Okay, now that is technically, it's a little bit um, around the wrong way. Technically, the flow rate should be derived from the water levels, not the other way around. But this is the way the rational method is. So you develop the flow rates first, and then you get a uh, determine a hydraulic grade line from that. The trouble is that the hydraulic grade line for the pipes you've given it might not actually fit in uh, below the grate levels. And that's where these settings come in because you've got two real solutions. If your hydraulic grade line for your flow rate doesn't fit in your pipe or doesn't fit in your link, you've got two options. You can make the pipes bigger, which is what we're doing here. And each time a pipe needs to be upsized, the whole system will be regraded with both these tick boxes on. Uh, and this would be considered a design run in the analysis where we're actually sizing the pipes to suit the storm. The alternative to that and what typically happens in a major event is you don't have, you're not sizing the pipes for the major event, but you will find that your pipes are too small for the storm. And that's where the QX routing increment comes in. It's basically QX is excess pipe flow or excess link flow, flow that doesn't actually fit in the pipe, but which has been calculated by the rational method. And we have to do something with it. And what we typically, typically do with it is we set this value uh, to a number greater than zero QMAX to initiate it. And that will choke down or reduce the inlet efficiency of selected pits automatically um, to only let as much flow as will fit into the underground system and keeping the remainder of the rational method flows on the above ground system. And that will help to better predict your, um, your uh, overland flows and your flood extents as well, okay? But we'll, we'll have a closer look at this when we get to the major event. For now, I just wanna get the system running and have a look in the output window. So running, it doesn't take very long for a system as small as this. It's doing a number of different passes to size the pipes. Um, and we've got a little red status bar um, saying finish plotting. Now, ideally it should say, go and look in the output window there, but at least our output window is flashing because that's, gonna, that's a, a clue there that um, there's details in the output window that we should go and have a look at. A red status bar indicates that there's at least one problem message in your output window. Now, if I just click on the output window to bring it up like I have there, I'll right click in the output window to untick auto hide and right click in it again to convert it from docking to floating. And just to make it a little bit easier to read all of the details, because now that is the full extent of what the analysis actually pumped into the output window there. And there's a range of different messages here. Some of them have these colored exclamation marks. And the problem messages are the ones we need to pay most attention to. Uh, but perhaps also the warning messages. And starting from top to bottom, this one, uh, this range of different uh, warning messages here uh, about the, how the hydraulic grade line cannot reach grade. Well, I can click on that line there, AO3, and it highlights exactly where in the network the problem is. Uh, it actually makes it hard to see with the highlighting though. So if I click away, it's actually complaining about uh, node AO3, which is this manhole here. 
and it's saying that the hydraulic grade line cannot reach the grate. It's only a warning though. Now I do get a lot of questions about this. It happens on the forum all the time, where people say, what does this message mean? How do I get rid of it? Well, the way to get rid of it is to change the design of your system, but it's not actually necessarily a problem. And that's why it's only a warning message. What it's saying though, is that the grate level at this node is higher than one of the nodes upstream. In other words, uh, it's kind of like you're trying to make water flow uphill. It's not exactly like that, but in the rational method at least, the hydraulics um, requires that the, the water surface elevations descend in the direction of flow. If we allowed the water surface elevation to go right up to the grate level there, it would be higher than the grate level at this node. And if the water level was higher at the downstream, it's gonna cause reverse flow in this pipe. And that is way beyond the scope of what the rational method can ever be expected to do, okay? Uh, because the rational method just estimates a peak flow rate. And it's pretty silly if we estimate a peak flow rate that's negative or backwards, okay? So we try and avoid that by saying, well, we don't allow the hydraulic grade line to get higher at this node than the level of this upstream node there. That's what those warning messages are about. And they're probably not gonna actually cause any issues at all in most minor analyses. Where it may cause an issue is in the major event. So we may come back and revisit this one when we do the major event. Okay, scrolling down, there's a whole bunch of lines here as it's sizing the different pipes and going through all the iterations there. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of messages about uh, info messages about all of our service crossings. But we do have one, I think, uh, case where we've actually, in sizing the, resizing the pipes, we've initiated a service clash. Um, and I believe the problem, it's a bit hard to see, there's a brown sewer line crossing there, but if I click on the line there, it actually highlights it. Um, it's this pipe here, and suddenly this pipe has been resized as a 450 diameter pipe with the same cover limit, so it's actually gone deeper, and now we're too close to this brown sewer line uh, in the section view here. And what can we do about it? Well, this is just um, something that we couldn't have anticipated initially when we did the initial grading way back, I think, in episode three. Um, so um, what we can potentially do is, um, uh, well, there's a number of different solutions. We could lower the sewer, that's probably one easy solution. We could probably uh, concrete encase this or make it a different class pipe, a much stronger class pipe and allow it to go higher so it's got a lower cover limit. Uh, but there's possibly other solutions as well. Um, this, I'll come back to that in just a sec though. This um, problem, this is another one. This is a bogus problem message here that really we could just as well not have produced this one. It's complaining that it cannot calculate the capacity volume at the SAG node there. Now our SAG pit is nowhere near its capacity. The SAG pit is gonna spill all the way over here, but it, 12D is trying to calculate the capacity and for whatever reason it's failing. And just because um, it comes up occasionally as a question, I'll show you how you can get rid of that one right now. I wanna go to node A02, I'll go back to editor, and I'll jump on node A02. I'm gonna to go to the node um, bypass tab. And the maximum ponding depth was calculated automatically by 12D at 113.4 millimeters. And it's that extra 0.4 that's caused some kind of numerical um, issue there, uh, possibly because my catchment boundary wasn't exactly drawn on the crest there or something like that. But just lowering it ever, ever so slightly by uh, setting it manually there, and going set no details. If I were to come back and reanalyze that, it would fix it. But there's a couple of other issues in terms of solving this um, pipe that's too close to the sewer line. Rather than just modifying this pipe, I'm gonna sort of step back a little bit and take a more holistic view here and say, well, this is the flattest part of my design and the problem here is my hydraulic grade line is getting too high there. It's getting too close to my uh, grate level uh, and I wanna make this pipe smaller. Okay, so really I wanna bring the whole hydraulic grade line down a little bit. And looking at where the losses are, 
I'm not seeing huge jumps in the hydraulic grade line except at this pit here. That's where there's a big loss. And if I go right down to that node, it's right, way down here near the outlet. And this is a nice little demonstration of the interconnectedness of all things in stormwater networks is that it may seem a bit counterintuitive, but to solve the issue we have up here, I'm going to propose we make a change here. Okay? Because the only thing we can do to improve the jump in the hydraulic grade line at this node, which is quite an inefficient node, there's a 90 degree bend and another lateral coming in as well. The only thing we can really do is reduce the velocity in the downstream pipe. And the only way we can really do that is to make this pipe a little bit bigger. Now that may seem like a uh, inefficient solution because we're making two pipes bigger here to save, to allow this little pipe to get smaller. But the whole advantage of it is doing it at the downstream end is you give your whole system a bit more capacity by doing that. By relieving the pressure at the downstream end, it affects the whole system upstream. And the simple way to do that, in fact, would be to um, jump onto your um, node where you want to make the change. And you could lock pipes, but an even simpler way of doing it is to go to the link design tab and set your minimum link height here. And I'm going to set it to 0.75 or 750 millimetres. And that means that all the pipes downstream or from this pipe onwards are going to be at least 750 in the sizing algorithm. And just to reinforce that, let's rerun the analysis. And there's a good little clue there that the status bar has gone green. That's probably going to indicate that I've gotten rid of all my problem messages. So yet no problem messages left. I solved two problems there. These are now 750s. The hydraulic grade line is now a bit lower than it was before. Um, and I've now got a 375 diameter pipe uh, way up here. And I'm, I'm now longer, no longer too close to my sewer line there. Okay, so that's one possible way of solving that. And that will probably stand us in good stead when we come to look at the major event as well. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a review there. There's lots of other possibilities. Again, I'm going over time and I'm, I've still got a fair bit to do here. So it is going to be a long episode, this one, this final episode. But hey, don't they normally make the final episode like a double episode or something like that? Well, hopefully I won't go for two hours. Let's try and keep it down. Um, Moving uh, on, let's say that we've now, we're happy with our, our minor event analysis and we've done a little bit of a, of a review there in the output window and how to deal with all of those problem messages. Let's have a little bit of a look at um, the major storm events now. Now the major storm, unlike some other um, packages that deal with the rational method, the major storm is just considered a just another storm event, okay? It's not fundamentally different from a minor event. You do have to specify um, the right frequency um, and you do have to nominate that it's a major event because there are settings in the network editor that are different for minor and major events, okay? Um, and you do have to be careful. It's, it's possible to run a major event that's got smaller rainfalls than your minor event and that's up to you to get right. Uh, but typically you're not sizing the pipes in the major event, so you want to turn off these two modify tick boxes. It's typically for checking your system, the combined system, underground and overland systems, that it can cope with a uh, somewhat more extreme rainfall event than what it was, what the pipes were designed for. Now, another common uh, misconception is that the flow rates are always higher in the major event compared with the minor event. Uh, that's not true necessarily in the underground system. Sometimes the pipe flow rates actually go down uh, compared with the minor event because suddenly certain parts of your pipe system become less effective uh, when more rainfall is thrown at them. Uh, but typically your overland flow rates are generally going to be much higher uh, in, than in the minor event. Now there's a little blurb here about the QX routing increment. I'm just going to demonstrate this live though. Let's go straight back to 12D and talk about the uh, major event. Okay, so all I really need to do after running the minor event, you can say we've done everything we need to do there. I swap the storm event type over to major. Now, 
because I've set this up with a water model template, it's already done all the changes I need it to do in terms of turning off these two tick boxes and it's setting a QX routing increment for me and that's set to um, 20 litres per second or 0.02 QMEX. Um, it's changed the frequency from 39.3% to 2%. That is a one in 50 year event that we're trying to run here. Um, we're using the same plot parameter files and we're going to override our plan results, but we are writing out to um, a different file name. It's got a major suffix there, or madge suffix. On the flood extents tab too, there's a, a, some of the models here are different from the in the minor event. Some are being reused. Um, the cross sections, for instance, you can reuse them. But largely the, the settings are the same. It's just a few output models are different. And again, each time you run um, the analysis, it remembers the settings from the panel and it remembers them separately for the minor and major events. Okay, so that's a very handy thing to know. Now, the first time I run the major event, I often set the QX routing increment to zero and have the modify pipe um, settings off here. So uh, what I'm saying is if the pipe flow rates are too big, tell me where they're too big. In other words, tell me where it doesn't fit. Um, and that's going to give me a sense of what sort of value I might be best to set this QX routing increment to. So I'll just go through this very quickly. It runs very quickly when you've got a, a zero routing increment and, and you're not sizing the pipes. But you can see your hydraulic grade line goes right up to the grade level in most of the um, part, on many parts of the network. Um, but of course, our roof drainage system too is now running largely dry now because the assumption we made with our roof drainage is in the major event, it doesn't get into the roof drainage because the whole gutter system there is considered inundated and the gutters are overflowing and they're instead flowing to the nearest road node there. So this whole roof drainage system isn't in operation in the major event as well. That's why we're seeing the the hydraulic grade line right along the invert there, but it is starting to back up a little bit um, where it starts to interface with the remainder of this network. Okay, but having run the major event now um, without a QX routing increment or set to zero, we see these little bits of red text saying QX equals something or other, QX equals something or other. And we're seeing a similar thing in the output window where we're seeing these Message, that's quite a long message, isn't it? Uh, they're easy to spot, I suppose, uh, about excess flow, where there's a number of different pipes here that have this excess flow. And what I tend to do is I look for the value, um, the largest value in this list of, of messages here. And in this case, it looks to be, well, that one, that one's very huge. I'm not gonna, I might just uh, overlook that one. But typically, I think it's around about two or three or four hundred um, liters per second. My typical general rule, which I don't think I'm going to apply today, is that take your worst case scenario of QX and consider about 10% of that value, and that's probably a good value to use. Now, it's not super critical here, but it is a little bit sensitive when you set this value. I'm going to go with 0.02 as it was originally, 20 liters per second. I wouldn't go smaller than uh, 0.01 here, 10 litres per second. The smaller the number, the longer it's going to take. The larger the number, it generally won't make too much of a difference, but it will run faster. But you may be a little bit too aggressive in the way we choke down um, the inlet nodes there to try and um, keep the hydraulic grade line just below the grate level. And we may subsequently, if this number is too high, we may over predict the flood extents a little bit and under predict the flow rates. So you do want to be a little bit careful with this number. I'm going to hit the run button now and see if that um, solves the problem for us. Now sometimes it looks like it's um, um, stopped doing things and hung. Now you get getting that little spinning wheel um, there in the analysis and that's a Windows thing. Somehow this process has taken a little bit too long and Windows has decided that uh, 12D is not responding. In fact, it is uh, responding, it's just Windows has lost the plot. Give it a bit of time, be patient, it will come back. Um, and it has come back, but I've got a red status bar there telling me that something's gone wrong. Um, and 
I've got a few problem messages here about approach flow exceeding road capacity, but I've still got this thing with excess flow. Now, ideally that QX routing increment should get rid of all of the excess flow, but it doesn't always work or it doesn't always happen. Uh, and sometimes you need to intervene. And this is a nice little demonstration of what to do when this happens. Uh, I'm getting a message here at this uh, manhole AO3 that I've still got excess flow. In this case, it's actually quite easy, but it's a case where it shouldn't have actually happened. If I go back to editor, I might just re release that highlighting and go to AO3. It's complaining here that I've still got this excess flow of 285 litres per second. That's flow that's included in this flow rate, but it doesn't actually fit in the pipe system. Now, what's actually happened here is I'm not actually sure um, whether this is a new feature or we may have got a problem that may need addressing here, but I'm not sure that 12D is doing the right thing here because it's setting the hydraulic grade line above the grate levels here, and it never should go above the grate levels in the rational method. Um, but the fix here is because, remember, we had this warning message that's still there in the output window about how the grate level here was higher than the grate level there. Well, if I just have a look at the two grate levels there and say on the node main tab, my grate level here is 30.279 and my grate level here is 30.1701. Well, let me see what happens if I set the grate level here manually to, what was the value, forgotten already? 170, let me try that. 170, set no details. That's gonna reduce the grate level ever so slightly. Now, I, I don't think I should have to do this. Now, I'm gonna have to investigate this um, a little bit, but sometimes you do in the major event to get the rational method to, to work as well as it can, you do need to make these little adjustments to the grate level. Um, more often than not, it's that you lift the grate level above that to allow, say, a manhole lid to go under a little bit of pressure. But here, what we're trying to do is make the grate levels um, descend. Okay, now having done that, I'll rerun the analysis. And what it's doing is it's progressively um, reducing the inlet efficiency eta at certain nodes to let just as much flow as is possible into the underground system. Um, um, so that we can get fill up the underground system as much as possible, leaving the remainder on the overland system. Okay, now I'll give it a little bit more time to, uh, to run. This time uh, Windows hasn't taken over and I can see the results are churning away there. But yeah, that was enough to solve the problem there. And instead we're getting, uh, rather than the hydraulic grade line going above, we're actually seeing what's supposed to happen here is that the inlet efficiency has been reduced at certain nodes. Now I might just um, clone this view quickly and create a major version of this. And I'll take off the minor flow results. Uh, there. And add on the major results, that will do. I'll add all of them. Okay, now they're showing up in a slightly more muted colour there, but you can see the flood extents in the major event are significantly different. They're much, much bigger. And what you're trying to prove typically in this sort of um, job is that you're containing the overland flood extents within the road reserve and you're not flooding properties. Okay, so it's a very different design criteria. What we're also seeing here uh, is we're seeing in a few spots that we're overtopping the crown. Wherever these you get these red bars with these um, Q warnings in this model here, we're overtopping the crown and you can reroute flow from one side to the other there. And there's a few examples of that in this network B if you download the project. We can also see that this sag pit at the top of the cul-de-sac on road C is actually spilling over the back of the verge there and running down our grassy swale. It's only a small flow rate that's bypassing there but you can see it coming down the swale and it's joining on into this massive sag pond that's just uh, spilling over in a big old mess there into the basin because it can't fit through the pipe system. Okay, so there, we have more or less though demonstrated that 
this design is, is probably okay or pretty close to okay in that it's largely contained within the road reserve and it's only spilling outside the road reserve at designated controlled spill points like at the swale there and at this spill point into the basin. So that's fundamentally how you'd go about doing the major event. Um, one thing you can do though, once you've got your major event is we're gonna start talking about outputs now. And I've got a handful of chains here in my uh, project, in the customer library of this project, all of these W06 chains. And once you're more or less happy with your design, you could sort of run this first one to convert um, your stormwater model to tri meshes, say. And this um, second, the W01, uh, W06B series um, has a, a range of different ones for converting the hydraulic grade line into a three-dimensional tri-mesh too, so that you could potentially look at it. Now, I've just run the major event in the stormwater model, uh, which is this one here. So if I were to, um, well, that just ran the chain. If I'll, I'll just show you quickly what that chain is. W06B stormwater major. All this chain is doing is uh, a couple of little steps here. One, it's running this um, panel that uh, I have shown in a previous webinar. It takes your stormwater model uh, and looks at the hydraulic gray line and turns it into tri meshes. Okay, so I've shown that in a previous webinar. I'm not going to go into details other than to point it out in this chain to say, hey, it's pretty good. Uh, but one thing it's also doing is it's taking the labels model that we produced from our plan plot and copying it to a model called um, stormwater labels major. So we're keeping a copy there of the major storm results. Okay, and why I'm bothering to show all of this is that it's part of um, assembling the outputs ready for our deliverables. So I want to keep a record of my major event as well as my minor event storms. So having run that chain, um, I'll also now, if I go into the perspective view, for instance, just minimize, got a few too many things open here. I'll just close some things down. Um, go to my perspective view. I could add on that um, stormwater HGL. In fact, I'll just type in HGL here to make it easier. Stormwater HGL major. And I'll bring my um, tin to the front because it's a transverse tin. And I can see there this little blue ribbon in the perspective view is the hydraulic grade line for the major event in my pipe system. And you can see it's very close to um, the grade level in a lot of the nodes there because we're, we've basically filled up our pipe system to as, fill, as full as it can be before it starts overflowing. Okay, and any overflow stays on the above ground system. And that's effectively what we've got. The, well, the flooded widths we're seeing there are not the major storm. They're still the minor storm events. So I've mixed things up a little bit there. Um, having run that um, major event and updated that uh, model though, uh, I now want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the deliverables. Okay, now I know I've, well, I'm actually not doing too bad for time. I'm a little bit over time, but I'm going to wrap things up very quickly. Now I know this is a big long list of deliverables and you might have expected with a, a name like project review and delivery that delivery would take a lot of time. Well, it could take a lot of time, but it, you can get it so automated in 12D that it actually can be all literally spat out at the push of a button if you, if you set things up correctly. Now I'm going to show you here outputs of drainage plans, of drainage long sections, of structure details. I'll produce a pitch schedule, a calculation table. I might even do a custom import and export and I'll produce a BIM. Now, I've that not all of these are in the chain. Certainly all of this BIM stuff is available in the chains I've shown you, but I'm gonna go through now. First up, I'll start with the drawings and we'll produce plans, long sections and structure details. Now, some of you may be familiar with some of this, some of you it may be entirely new for, but typically what we're going for here are the options under the plot menu and you're probably all familiar with the fact that we've got a water long section PPF editor and maybe even a water plan PPF editor. That's what we've been using already in fact to produce these plot models um, in, in long section and in plan. 
But now we're going to use a different set of PPFs um, um, to produce drawings. And rather than show it through the plot menu, and there's also the water node diagram, which will do your structure details now. That's a new PPF. A lot of people wouldn't have seen that yet. Uh, but I'll do a demonstration of all of these. But rather than do it through the PPF editor menu here, I'm going to do it through multi-page plots and, and show you the thing, well, the things that it can do as well in a very, very concise way. Uh, I know that my colleague Dylan from New Zealand is going to be doing a more uh, widespread uh, webinar on the multi-page plot or MPS as it's known. Um, he's done, I think he's already done one and he's planning some more. Uh, but I'm going to show you just a quick demonstration of what you can do uh, just from the stormwater point of view. I'm just going to load up an MPS file that I've got in my customer library. Again, you can download this data and have a look at this and study how this has been done as well and read it into this multi-page plot editor. And effectively, um, this is going to do a nice little drawing set, produce a nice little drawing set to a single PDF file um, of a number of different sheets that include uh, four different plans. So it's going to, and these are mainly for verification. So uh, they've got a lot of detail on them rather than just final production drawings. But I've got, uh, for, I'm broken up this design into a northern and a southern section for the scale that I'm plotting it at. And I'm showing the, both the minor and the major storm results on the four different plan sheets. And that's including the plan plots that I've already produced. So the plan plot, uh, the drainage plan plot or the water plan plot is just one component of an actual drainage plan drawing. Okay, you've also got contours and catchment strings and, and uh, anything else that you need on your um, water plans. I'm actually including the overland flood results on my water plans as well. Okay, as well as that though, you can use your standard plot parameter file straight out of the library and produce your long section plots. There's a special thing in MPS called a special chapter, this little sort of magic wand icon there. And you can go through and specify, I want to, for this chapter of my um, drawing set book, if you like, for this chapter, I want to produce or plot a plot parameter file. And you can specify, now this is using one straight out of the library, in, in dollar lib there, uh, and I, you can specify what model you want to plot and any strings out of that that you don't want to uh, plot and save that away and do it for both the SWT model and the stormwater model, so transverse and longitudinal. And lastly, but not leastly, we now have this new uh, plot parameter file, uh, which again is another special chapter in the MPS called a water node PPF, which is going to do the structure details as well. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of how these PPS actually work. You can look at the ones that are installed in the library and look at this example MPS file um, to study it to see how it works, and we can take it from there if you have any questions on that. But to actually get it to do what it's supposed to do, after reading it into the editor, you just hit the plot book button, and it's going to go and produce this multiple page PDF drawing set of all of our outputs or all of the drawing outputs that we need. Okay, so I'll let it do its thing. It takes a few seconds um, to produce all of the sheets it's going to produce. But it's quite a powerful thing and I would encourage people to uh, have a look at it uh, to see the sorts of things it can do. Um, it's a lot of people are already using this in their, in their uh, for final drawing production. Uh, but some people are yet to actually see. So here's the PDF that's popped up and I can see it's one of 16 pages. I've got four plans there. There's my northern part of my design showing my minor storm results and then the major storm results. If I toggle back and forth there, you can see the major storm floods are slightly larger there. The next sheet, sheet three and four, is the southern part of the design and I can see my minor storm results and my major storm results. And the numbers should be changing too, unless I've made a mistake. Um, um, looks like I have made a mistake there, actually. I've, I've, it's the numbers in the plan plot haven't actually changed there, but uh, that's easily fixed. It's also producing our long sections for our transverse model. 
Uh, and you can use any plot parameter file you like, yeah, but the one we ship with the PW, the public work standard, this is what it looks like. Um, and this is our new uh, standard water long section PPF and it's doing the, the longitudinal model as well. And it's showing you the, um, the, uh, the annual exceedance probability um, on the, for the hydraulic grade line as well and the flow rates that it's showing you. Uh, and lastly, right at the end of the drawing set, uh, we're showing some structure details. And this is what this new PPF, the water node diagram PPF can produce for you. Um, if you zoom right in there, it's showing you um, the kinds of structure details that you often need to uh, provide on drawings um, uh, uh, to a pretty good level of detail. Okay, so that's already available and none of this was drafted. It's all been produced automatically from our model. Okay, so uh, a huge amount of information was just produced. So that's going to cover the drawings side of the deliverables. I'll just close that down, don't need to save. Um, the next part of the deliverables though was the tables. And there's a few different ways to produce um, tables. In fact, you can just go to the water menu and the water string and go to reports. And there's a whole range of different reports here for reporting different things, including things like pitch schedules. And they're all pretty straightforward to use um, and you get what you get, but there are other ways to produce more uh, finessed or customized reports. And that's typically, again, through the network editor. If I load my network editor back in, I believe there's only one button that we haven't really used much yet uh, in this whole series, and that's the import export button. So if I load my stormwater model in and go import export, um, I could produce a pitch schedule by going out to a um, spreadsheet by choosing customized list file and nominating uh, this particular customized list file that again is installed in the library. There's a whole bunch of these uh, .txt files installed in the library that begin with the word drainage. And these are a whole range of different customized list files for producing um, uh, custom reports. And you obviously you can customize them and make your own as well. But we ship a whole bunch of good examples is what I'm trying to say. So if I were to run that one, for instance, and uh, that's just, by running it, that's just dumps the whole report onto the Windows clipboard. And I can just open up a blank Excel workbook and control V. And there's a little pitch schedule example, for instance. I could add a new uh, worksheet on there, though I won't go into details of what the actual pitch schedule is showing because everybody likes their own pitch schedules, but there's a lot of data in there. Uh, but I can do more than just pitch schedules. I could, for instance, choose a different customized list file, say looking in the library there, there's one called drainage report QDM. This is the standard Queensland Urban Drainage Manual calculation table that a lot of people need to end up, you know, producing and sometimes even putting on drawings. Okay, so go ahead and run that one. And this is a much more uh, comprehensive table. Go back to Excel, once it's, once it's copied onto the Windows clipboard, go to a blank sheet, and paste it in, and that's what the QDM worksheet looks like. And it is quite straightforward to produce um, that table, and it's all filled in with all the gory details. You can um, format this in Excel and make it look pretty as a table, um, and, and do what you will with it there. Uh, you can just save it straight from Excel to a PDF file and insert it into your drawing set if, if that's what you need to do. It's often the easiest way to do it but there are other ways of turning that into a CAD table if you need to as well. Um, there's another option. There is an example in here called, in the customer library it must be, called drainage network checks that allows you to not just export to a spreadsheet, but import back in again. Um, now, if anyone would like to know a bit more about that, that, that pops up a lot on the 12D forum, questions on how to do imports and exports via a spreadsheet. Um, I might um, uh, refer to that rather than doing a live demo of it, but there's a nice little example there. It's basically just copying and pasting from a spreadsheet uh, using the Windows clipboard as the intermediate. And once you modify the spreadsheet, you can move this panel over to import mode and it will import directly from the Windows clipboard whatever you've pasted back onto it, okay? And, and subsequently update attributes and and string properties and things like that along the way. Um, 
so lastly, I wanted to finish up with um, a little bit on uh, BIM. And I will be wrapping up very, very quickly. I'm, I am sorry, I have, this is probably the most over time out of all the episodes. Um, but looking at our perspective view here, I do have a number of chains, uh, WO6 that I uh, have mentioned, specifically about converting um, the drainage model to tri meshes uh, if you need to. And there's various reasons why you might need to. Because our stormwater models are made up of um, channels and bypass nodes and things that we don't actually need to build, they're just there for modelling purposes, converting them uh, to tri meshes is a great way to filter out these channels and bypass nodes from your final deliverable, uh, if, if your final deliverable is a BIM model, for instance. So uh, this particular chain here, this um, stormwater, WO6A stormwater to tri mesh, uh, not only converts um, both the SW and SWT models to tri meshes via uh, this panel, which is simply the generate tri meshes from 12D objects panel. Uh, but it also uh, goes ahead, after it does that, it deletes out the um, um, channels and the bypass nodes as well uh, with this command. And it also does something else. It's running a, uh, a couple of, or a macro, a couple of times on both these different models here. Uh, and I have again shown this macro in a previous webinar called Create Headwall Tri-Meshes. And that has gone and uh, attempted to create a headwall tri-mesh that is fitted to each one of the headwall nodes in our job. And we can get these quite good looking um, tri-meshes of headwalls at all of our headwall nodes where we had nothing before, simply by running this particular chain. Okay, so it converts the whole thing. In fact, these are all tri-meshes that I'm seeing on the screen here. There's the tri-mesh of the hydraulic grade line. There's the individual pipe tri-mesh. There's nodes, there's um, uh, lintels and grates and head walls and all of that. Now they can all get bundled up, including the flood extents and all of that sort of stuff too, into a, a collection of data to go out to an IFC. And uh, in fact, there is a chain to do that as well, right at the end, after you've produced all of your hydraulic grade lines and things like that, um, you can have a look at this final chain. And it's again, it's very simple. And I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert on the IFC writer, uh, but I do have an example here if you are needing to produce BIM models. Uh, that whatever you put in there, in this case it is dumping out all the tri meshes and the hydraulic grade lines and the flooded widths and all of that sort of thing and uh, dumping it out to an IFC file. In this case it's an, an IFC 4x1 file which is the latest version supported uh, and in the IFC step zip format. Uh, and depending on what package you're trying to read that IFC into, it may determine uh, which version and which format you want to use. Um, uh, now, I don't actually have any BIM packages um, installed other than 12D and 12D, 12D model and 12D view. And I've, someone told me that I shouldn't use 12D view as a BIM package because it's not something that's external to 12D solutions. It doesn't prove that we've created an IF, uh, a BIM model. Well, I could come back and argue, well, forget about the IFC. Look at this perspective view. This is what, to a lot of people, this is what BIM is, being able to see everything in 3D and spin it around. And uh, on that note, without actually showing you that BIM export, uh, other than showing you the IFC file, um, I would like to wrap things up and say, I hope you've enjoyed this series. Uh, I know I've covered a lot of things very, very quickly. It was only meant to be a sort of a condensed overview of the training in the way we normally train uh, this part of the, the software package. Um, uh, but I'd now, uh, after much going over time, like to open the webinar up uh, to answer any questions that we may have had along the way. Thanks, Owen. Um, yes, because of the, the time, I will just do, I think, two questions live today. Um, okay. And we'll um, yep, do that now. So. Kate in Melbourne would like to know, um, what is the problem with ignoring excess flow 
um, OX in pipes? Uh, yeah, the QX. Um, the, ex the problem with ignoring it is it's kind of like a volumetric error in that the numbers don't add up, in that the rational method has um, estimated a peak flow rate for us, but it physically doesn't fit in the pipe. And so if you leave it in the pipe, which is what um, you're doing if you've got a message about QX, then you haven't actually um, balanced the flows properly. What you need to do is get that excess flow or eradicate that excess flow. Never let that water enter into the underground system by choking down um, the, um, the inlet efficiencies. And normally that happens automatically. Sometimes you may need to manually intervene. Sometimes it might be a little great level adjustment like I showed earlier. Uh, and sometimes you can make even manual adjustments to the uh, inlet efficiencies as well to, to make it all happen. There are cases though uh, where simply your, your model is simply too complex for the rational method, uh, especially in the major event, because what we're doing here with this QX routing, it is technically beyond what the rational method was ever intended to do. We are pushing the rational method probably further than it was ever intended to be pushed. And if you, after all of this effort, can't get sensible results out of the rational method uh, in 12D, what it's really trying to tell you is your model is too complicated for the rational method and it's probably time to start looking at the dynamic drainage instead, okay? Because there are limits to, certainly there are limits to what the rational method can do. Sure, thanks. And uh, James in Brisbane asks, uh, what about the new AR and R methodology and dynamic drainage? Yes, uh, there have been a number of, uh, I guess, questions or complaints saying, why aren't you showing this in dynamic? Uh, why are you focusing on the rational method in this series? The intention of this series was to show basic and intermediate and that we always start in the rational there. And even if you do need to uh, follow the new AR and R uh, methodology in the dynamic, I would still recommend you have a pretty good grasp on the rational method in 12D model as well before you go down there because it's always a good benchmark to test against. Despite what some people may say, I'm going to disagree with them and say, I would almost always do a rational method before delving into a hydrograph method. There's a, a, a order of magnitude more data and more complexity in a hydrograph method, especially following the new AR and R methodology. Um, and it's a lot easier to make mistakes and having that benchmark or baseline to, to check against um, in the rational method is going to be very, very handy. It's certainly a lot, lot easier to, per, to uh, verify and check the rational method results against your dynamic um, sort of uh, ensemble results that you get from the new AR and R methodology. We're certainly not presenting this webinar, this series at least, to say you should only use the rational method. We've got a whole suite of more sophisticated modules available in 12D model for doing all sorts of things with stormwater um, design, but we are we wanted to focus this particular series on the basic and intermediate aspects because, to be honest, there's enough detail just in that to, to fill this series and more. I've gone over time in every one of my episodes because there's so much detail involved. And this is just the basics, okay? It only gets more detailed from here on in, guys. Okay, great. Um, so the recording of today's webinar will be available in coming days through the webinars page on our website, and we'll pop it up on the 12D Model YouTube channel. We'll also email the link to all registrants, and I'll, um, yeah, as I've been doing, I'll include li links to the previous episodes in there, and I think as Owen demonstrated, they're on the user forum and a whole bunch of places too, so you can watch the whole series together. Keep an eye on our emails and social media for details of our future webinars. Um, we've got the follow-up to the MPS uh, one next week as well. And if you need to contact us in the meantime, our details are on the screen now. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you all for attending, and we hope to see you at future webinars.